Again, to repeat the shocking headline, there are at least four ways to hijack your phone through a back door. In part one of this series, I described the first two back doors. This video will continue to the next two back doors, and then at the end, we will discuss how you can protect yourself from the implications of these attacks coming up. The first part of the series talked about two backdoor attacks on your phone. The first was the SimJacker attack, an attack discovered by Adaptive Mobile Security. And the second was the SS7 attack, which was revealed by Edward Snowden and was shown in a 60 Minutes program. Now let me continue with a couple more backdoors that can make our cell phone vulnerable. Number three backdoor is simjacking. Now, although the name is similar, I will differentiate simjacking with the simjacker hack I discussed in the first video. Simjacking means creating a duplicate SIM card which has the same identifiers as your phone. Instead of using the SS7 protocol to route traffic to the attacker, this attack is done by duplicating the original SIM card. So the attacker phone appears to be the same phone. You can actually buy a device on the internet that can create fake SIM cards with fake identifiers. Remember that the two identifiers on a SIM card are the IMEI, actually the IMEI is on the hardware, which identifies each unique device, and then there's the IMZ, which identifies you on the network as a subscriber. So all phone billing and tracking and routing are controlled by the IMZ. Thus, if your SIM card has the same IMZ as someone else, you can replicate their phone and you can make international calls with someone else's account. Now, this attack by itself is typically random. Someone basically steals your subscription from the phone carrier by guessing an IMZ number. However, this attack can also be used for specific targeting. All it takes is for some insider in the phone company to activate a SIM card for a specific IMZ. So it could be an agent for a three-letter agency or someone paid to do this at any phone carrier. This could be done in any country. The result of duplicating the SIM card is that the attacker gets to capture your text messages and calls and of course intercept two-factor authentication messages which controls your internet account. Number four backdoor to your phone is Stingray or Kingfish. This is the fourth way to backdoor your phone using a Stingray device or otherwise known as an IMSI catcher. The original Stingray was developed by the Harris Corporation and is widely used in law enforcement. Law enforcement agencies were often prevented from discussing Stingray by contract. And until recently, they didn't even require any kind of warrant to use it. There are newer models of Stingray like Kingfish. The original one was limited to 2G and 3G. The US Department of Homeland Security funded the distribution of Stingray to many large cities in the US. This was initially developed for the military and three-letter agencies. The way this works is as a man in the middle. Stingray operates like a rogue cell tower. If a Stingray-like device is present, it can jam your phone signal so your phone reconnects to the phone network. Except your phone will reconnect to the Stingray device itself. Your phone will think that that is your cell tower. Another approach used in 4G is to send a message that causes your phone to think that it got deactivated from the network. And thus it will try to prove its identity by resending IMZ information. The Stingray device will forward your traffic to the carrier via the internet with the permission of the carrier. So your phone will operate just like normal, but the party in the middle can track your traffic. It can surveil you, identify your locations, listen into your conversations, and capture your internet data traffic. What is interesting about this attack is that because of the many flaws in the cell communication protocols, you can force a phone to default to sending the data with no encryption. And this allows the data to be captured. In some countries, the use of Stingray is unnecessary because they just ban encryption on all cell traffic. So be careful when traveling abroad since all your cell activity could be mass collected in unencrypted form. 
Stingray is primarily a government-initiated attack. It used to be in the purview of the US government, but nowadays hackers have figured out how to emulate Stingray. And in Washington DC and other places with embassies, you will often find an IMSI catcher trying to target your phones just by driving by them. Now Stingray may have some other capability. It may be able to update firmware on your phones, so there's a permanent malware embedded in there. I've had people tell me that when they drive by certain locations in Maryland and Virginia that their phone signals a carrier update and that's on iOS. On Android, I don't think there's a message that tells you that there's a carrier update. It just loads it automatically. Again, understand that the carrier update writes instructions for the cell baseband. This is not under the control of iOS or Android. Be aware that the cell baseband has access to the same memory bus as your phone operating system. So it can read the data in memory, such as from running other apps. I can only guess here at what's possible. So those are the four known backdoors that can be used to hack your phones. And all these attacks are independent of the operating system, iOS, Android, or Linux. Everything I've talked about here is about known backdoors. There could be unknown backdoors. The common thread to these attacks is that they are mostly used by state players. This is not the kind of attack we would expect from normal hackers since it requires a deeper infrastructure. This is more worrisome for people engaged in journalism since each can be targeted to reveal sources. It can be used by governments to reveal dissident and then eliminate them. These are basically tools of power. Although the ability to intercept phone calls is a long established capability of governments since the beginning of telephones, we are under the impression that we have secure devices today that can afford us some private communication. That is not the case. As I learn more about this, I want to use the cell less and less. I want to use alternative encrypted communication methods. Or even if I use the carrier's data, I want my data to be encrypted. So this is my first advice shift to using encrypted messaging platforms, for example, like Signal. Now, I personally don't like Signal because it identifies me with a phone number. Fortunately for me, I have my own encrypted messaging app, Brax.me, and you can try that out. It's free. Next, we need to rely less on SMS for two-factor authentication. Anytime you use SMS for authenticating with any site, your internet accounts can be compromised particularly by a state level attacker. So I would use software based authentication based on time like Authy or Google Authenticator, or I would use a hardware key for authentication like a UB key. You can watch my video on the UB key. Email, by the way, can be intercepted too. Email is even worse as a two factor authentication since email is not encrypted at all. It's probably the worst and the easiest to hack. Thanks for watching guys and I'm always watching out for your privacy. I have to get other people to see this video so they learn and the only way to get that to happen is to convince the Google algorithm. And it decides this when you slam on that like button, the subscribe and the notification bell. So help the algorithm along.